having a particularly hard time this morning getting the mask just in the right place so that my glasses don't fog up. Uh, <clears throat> so excuse the commotion. I'd like to begin by sharing this with you from uh, a reflection service that we've used here in the past uh, for, called Lectionary. And it's uh, published by Dan Jakovich, who's a church consultant and who's worked with us at Calvary before. Taking up one's cross is an often heard phrase in Christian circles. It is good that believers have made Jesus' word our own rallying cry, but we might have dulled the power this statement had in its original context. Crucifixion was a tool of state control exercised by the Romans in the first century. It was reserved for insurrectionists, but as is often true with empires, thousands of members of the lower classes were deemed worthy of this charge with little regard for their individual actions. To be crucified meant that you had no social power to fight your sentence and yet Jesus is asking people to take on this powerlessness willingly. Crucifixion was also a source of incredible shame. Josephus, the Jewish, Jewish historian who lived in the first century, called it, quote, the most wretched of deaths, unquote. And Cicero, the Roman rhetorician, called it, quote, the tree of shame. Unquote. Victims would be nailed to the wood with very little clothing for all to see. The Romans chose the busiest places to parade them and display them so as to teach a lesson to the masses. There was no privacy in which to endure the pain for those who were condemned. Jesus put two options before his followers. Selfishly hold on to one's life and ultimately become ashamed before God. Or give up one's life on a cross and presently suffer the shame that came with doing so. In his time, this was a radical and challenging call to be willing to be viewed as weak, despised by the dominant culture. I would say that it's not just in Jesus's time that that would be so, because certainly for us, particularly here in the United States, there are some things that we value more than others. And one of the things is our ability to make choices, to say yes, to say no to be in charge when things don't go our way to uh, complain and that if we have a particular uh, problem at a higher level that we have ways of trying to deal with those problems even if we, we don't always succeed. And then we have law courts and we have all kinds of recourse to be in charge, at least of our little corner of life. But what if that was all taken away from us? What would we rely on then? Who would we rely on then? It's been talked about more and more, at least in some Christian circles, that as our country uh, continues to become more secularized. That is that as religion gets pushed more aside, the churches are, are looked at with much more suspicion than ever before, that church leaders are under great scrutiny for any possible misstep that uh, could be pounced upon. And just that 
Christianity is looked upon by some in our world almost as a hate organization. In spite of what Jesus preached and taught because the churches in many ways still run counter to the culture in which we live, people conclude that we are people of hate, of bigotry, and that we don't really care what anybody else feels or thinks because we know that we're right and that everybody else is wrong. And so in some countries, like for example, in Canada right now, there are certain things that clergy cannot say in sermons. Otherwise they can be charged with a hate crime. If they challenge the popular understandings on, on, on uh, sexuality or on other aspects of morality, they can be charged with a hate crime. Um, <clears throat> just as one example. And so there is a sense that our living of a, the faith, which for most of us and for most of our lives and conceivably for a number of years yet into the future has been rather simple and easy. We go to church and we go home. We can be as involved in the church as we want to be or not involved at all. We can, uh, we can uh, believe pretty much this way or that way and find fellow Christians who agree with us. We can become involved in different activities, either espousing a particular point of view or serving the poor, uh, taking care of the homeless, uh, feeding the hungry, et cetera, et cetera. All those things we can continue to do, and we do, and we do them throughout the world. However, there comes a point where some people begin to look with suspicion on, on us. Now, there are some Christians, of course, that are very outspoken. Some Christians who, uh, you know, gained a lot of political notoriety with the pre previous administration, but not just with them, but going back several administrations. And there are always those who try to curry favor with those who are in power because it will make their propagation of the message that much easier, so they think. And all the privileges that Christian churches have received through since the beginning of this country, particularly in the area of not being taxed in certain things, that is something that has made it possible for the churches to uh, grow, to spread, and to be able to carry out much of the work that we do that benefits the community, whether it's believers or non-believers that are the recipients of that uh, outreach. But we come to a point where if we stand for particular things, that we may be challenged. And it is conceivable that if we cling to our faith, that we could in time be threatened. A lot of what is happening is, is subtle, but nevertheless, there are those who try to call our attention to this, not that there will be wholesale persecution and people dragged out of church and, and all of that. But if we look around the world and see how many places being a Christian is just the mo about the most dangerous thing you can be. We get an idea of what Jesus is really talking about when he talks about carrying the cross. Carrying the cross doesn't mean putting up with the food that you don't like. Carrying the cross doesn't have anything to do with putting up with your annoying neighbor. 
or of, you know, just, you know, grin and bear it kind of things that we say too. Carrying the cross, willingness to carry the cross means being willing to suffer for our faith. And sometimes that suffering comes because of misunderstanding, will come because of misunderstanding. Sometimes it will come because people don't want to hear what we have to say, or that people will be suspicious of us and our goodness because they might think we're just trying to convince them of something and we are trying to convince them of a way of life that speaks to us, that gives our life meaning and purpose and direction. And then again, we can be certain that there will be those who are going to be put to death because of their belief. Just recently again, I read about the, uh, the 14, I think there were 14 martyrs among Coptic Christians, Christians from Egypt, that were captured by uh, members of uh, Al-Qaeda no, Al and were all beheaded in a most horrible fashion, and it was all recorded. They were all in orange jumpsuits. And one of the other people that was there and went through the beheading was someone who admired them for their courage of not denying their Lord in front of the threat of being beheaded. We believe in the promise of everlasting life that we have been welcomed into from the moment of our baptism. We have been promised the victory over the power of sin and suffering and even death itself. And the beginning of the fulfillment of that promise is what we heard about in the first lesson today from the book of Genesis and the promises that God makes to Abraham and to Sarah. We didn't hear about Sarah sitting in the background and laughing hysterically when she heard about this because you say, oh yeah, sure, at my age, I'm going to sleep with my husband and we're going to have a baby, right. And Abraham later on himself gets a good laugh out of it too. But it's a promise that's made and it's a promise that's kept. And that's the beginning of the promise that is made to you and me by the one who died on the cross for our salvation. The one who invites you and me to follow in his footsteps the one who invites us to take our faith seriously enough to ask ourselves the question, if I was going to be arrested because of my faith today, what would I do? What would I say? Would I compromise my beliefs? Would I compromise my, my Lord? Would I sell him out? like Judas did. I think it's a question worth asking ourselves. What would I do if I was being persecuted for my faith? What would happen if everybody in my family turned against me because they don't want to associate with me because of my faith? What would I do if I'd lose my job? Because, not because I'm standing in the workplace and preaching, but because it's known that I believe in God, that I believe in Jesus Christ, that I believe in what the church 
teaches, and I believe in what the scriptures say. Even though there could be differences of opinion how that all shakes out. Because I take it seriously, and others may not like that, am I willing to lose my job for that? Are we willing as, as a church, both individually as a parish and, and wider, to lose whatever benefits we have in order to be faithful so that we don't have to compromise with local authority? And I'm not talking about ripping off our masks and pretending like nothing's wrong. But what I'm talking about is if we were under certain restrictions that we could not, for example, when all things would be you know, allowed again, that we would not be allowed to have mass on the grass because our being outside praying outside our building might be offensive to someone. Or that we would be told to turn off the carillon because the ringing of the bells and the playing of those hymns twice a day offends. There's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. And the cancel culture, as it's referred to, can be brought to bear on us as well. As we're journeying through Lent, and I think especially this year because we have the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus performs certain miracles, but always tells people, don't tell anybody about this. He doesn't want people following him around and thinking that he's a number one whatever because he wants them to understand that there is a cross that must be carried. There is a demand of discipleship that has to be taken up if you're going to be his disciple. If we're going to follow him faithfully, how are we going to change our individual life values? How are we going to convert away from those things that we all do that compromise our faith and that make other people think that, well, you know, he's okay, she's okay because they don't take that religion stuff too seriously. Well, all I know is that there will come a time when we will have to make an answer to the one who made us about how we have lived this life and this gift. And hopefully we'll be able to answer truthfully what he already know of how seriously we took this faith of ours. It's tough. It's hard to believe and it's hard to persevere when everything seems to be going in the opposite direction. But yet, it's what we are called to, and Jesus himself shows us that being lifted up on the cross is not the only part of the story, because there's a resurrection. That's why those people who give, their, give up their lives and have done so since the beginning as martyrs, believed and came to know that victory over even death itself and that we cling so tenaciously to. So let that be in the forefront of our minds what God promises to us. But also let's know that whatever sacrifice we make now, whatever carrying of the cross that we go through now will also be for the here and now a way that we will come to see and know that Christ is with us because he will not allow us to bear our cross alone. He won't ask us to carry it 
if he's not willing to carry it with us. That's why when we celebrate the Eucharist, we just don't remember what happened at the Last Supper. We remember what happened the next day and two days after that. We remember Good Friday, and we remember the waiting and the resurrection. So may this celebration today whether in person or virtual, renew our faith, strengthen our hope, and deepen our love for the one who has called us to be his holy people, the one whom Paul extolled, the one who Abraham believed in, and the one who has saved us.